The answer to that is no. <laughs> no, we, I mean, it's, it's a, a real puzzle. I mean, the, we haven't talked about prions, and there's probably no point in giving a lecture on prions, but the, these are protein-only agents, and the, and the way they replicate <coughs> is they induce their abnormal shape on the normal protein that's uh, on the surface of, of neurons in the brain. So these cells carry this prion, and these normal proteins are produced through the normal genetic mechanisms of the host. Uh, for some reason, and well, let me say, proteins, in order to carry out their function, have to <coughs> come to a final shape, and the, the specifics of, of that shape, whether they're an antibody or an enzyme or whatever, <coughs> it determines their function, and if they don't have that proper shape, they don't function properly. And <coughs> so, um, but when these proteins change their shape into an abnormal form uh, that's prion-like, uh, i.e. leads to disease and also leads to accumulation uh, as, as a, an insoluble protein in the brain as amyloid, then <coughs> they become this strange uh, agent, which is the protein-only agent of, called a prion. And... Uh, the, and so they can cause disease. Why the process occurs spontaneously and causes disease at this fairly regular level of one per million per annum in all human populations is not known. But it's an epidemiological fact Well, they were very upset when they were told that this pr practice was prohibited against, was against the law. Um, no one explained why, but it was. And uh, so th they felt very badly about it. But there wasn't much they could do. The, 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 the police were around. Um, the, the government was all powerful. There were so many changes taking place at that time, the whole world was overwhelmed. Um, because the, the, it was only at the beginning of the 1950s that they became aware of the outside world. And um, I mean, one of the privileges of my life is to have grown up, <coughs> in a real sense, in a, in a community where, when I first came there, everyone over the age of 15 <coughs> had lived in a world where they used stone tools and they had direct connection to the past and no knowledge of the modern world. And that transition took place while I was there. And that tr transition will never occur again in human society. So it was an extraordinary change. And so there were so many things that were overwhelming them that <coughs> this was just one of them that they had to, they had to deal with. And although surreptitious <coughs> uh, eating of the dead did take place, it very... Uh, quickly, at least over the span of this 10-year period, completely died out. Well, firstly, the, for some, again, for reasons we don't understand, <coughs> is that the, there are different strains of prions and they have quite different uh, effects and, um, and they have their own characteristics which uh, we don't understand why. For example, uh, BSE in cattle, variant C uh, as classical CJD in humans and Kuru in humans, are diseases of the brain and they don't really affect any other organ at all, although their transmission may involve lymphoid tissue at some point. But variant CJD which is the human form of BSE, that not only involves the brain, but also lymphoid tissue throughout the body. Now, why that is, we have no idea. But <clears throat> that brings in this additional risk, the public health risk, uh, because um, you, you won't get Kuru from the, the blood, but you are at risk of getting variant CJD from the blood of someone who has the disease or is incubating it. 
and there are probably a few thousand people in the UK who will never get variant CJD because the incubation period will be beyond their lifespan, who are incubating it and who are at risk of transmitting it to others through blood transfusion or through organ transplantation. We don't know. We don't know why. I mean, the, the, there are the, the prion um, occurs in on the surface of lymphoid cells as well as neurons, but there are many different strains depending on the different shape that the different abnormal shape that these prions adopt, and <clears throat> the specifics of that shape determine <clears throat> the characteristics of the strain. And this will determine the disease that it causes, and it will determine the distribution of the body, and, <clears throat> the, uh, and the, the, whether or not <clears throat> it will uh, lead to this induction of uh, the change in neurons or in lymphoid tissue. In some cases, both. In some cases, neither. Some, I mean, scrapie is a disease of sheep. It will not infect humans won't work, doesn't connect. We don't know why. I'm just going to ask a very quick question before we come to the gentleman at the back there. Um, the, the young man up there was talking about, uh, you know, when, we, when they stopped the cannibalism, that it changed the narrative of the, of the foray because their spirits had, some, had to find some other way of, of leaving. But by the same token, sorcery was also part of the, the, the tribal narrative. And if someone like you comes along and says, well, you know, here's another reason why this disease is occurring. We heard the man in the, on the film saying, well, I can just induce, you know, crew like that, you know. Surely that also uh, changes the narrative. And I mean, did you get a, a feeling that your work there was impacting on, on their cultural life like that? Well, to some extent. The young, younger people mm -hmm. um, have, in some cases, have adopted the germ theory. They'll, they'll accept this explanation. This is some kind of germ, some kind of agent that's causing the disease. Others will <clears throat> refuse to acknowledge that at all. And say oh, malaria or pneumonia or something, that may be, you may be right there because you've got ways of treating it. How do you treat Kuru? You haven't got no treatment. So you don't understand it. <clears throat> so don't tell me what it's about. It's caused by sorcery. Other people <coughs> will believe both. And everyone in this room probably has three or four belief systems that they carry in their head that they don't quite acknowledge, but <coughs> 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 it, that's easy to do. So, okay, in some circumstances, maybe it's, you know, sorcery, <coughs> but it could also be a germ that, you know, gets involved. So, I mean, you know, that... So it's, it's challenged their belief systems, but it hasn't destroyed them by, by any means. Well, yeah, that's a very good question. We, um, <clears throat> it's one of the, the most exciting things that's come out of this work in recent years. I mean, we've been following the disease, following the epidemiology, <clears throat> but also looking at genetics. And there have been two major things. One is a little bit difficult to explain, but it was talked about in the film. And there's this balancing selection. And that's at <clears throat> a particular codon. Um, and... Uh, in the prion protein gene, codon 129, and if, <coughs> if a person is heterozygous, uh, these have different <coughs> proteins, they are different amino acids uh, at this locus on the two different chromosomes, then they tend to be resistant. So when we've looked at the survivors of the epidemic, people that we know have been exposed, they're key to understanding uh, <coughs> the genetics of the disease. And they are virtually all heterozygous, whereas uh, in the past, it was the young children who were all homozygous. They're mostly methionine, methionine, uh, codon 129. And <clears throat> the older people in the past tended to be heterozygous, methionine, valine. But all of the, the long-term survivors have been heterozygous. But in addition, we've now discovered 
a new variant in some families at codon 127, which is very close to 129, and that variant uh, seems to lead to complete resistance. So uh, these, the, the, if the disease had just gone on, uh, the, the population would have virtually died out. I mean, in some communities, the ratio of, of, uh, of women to, to men was um, very low. I mean, they were very short of women because of Kuru in, 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 those, uh, in those communities. But because of this <coughs> genetic change, it's, and this is human evolution occurring over a few generations, the <coughs> there would have been a small... <coughs> A group of people, and, and uh, through this bottleneck, that presumably the the population would have continued to survive, uh, despite the practices. Yeah, well, that that was one of the things that came out of <coughs> the epidemiological analysis that that I did in in sixty four and sixty five, and <coughs> we were the. Uh, it was the women and children who were involved in the consumption of the internal organs, uh, particularly the brain. They were the ones that came down with Kuru. The children who were born since 1960, after the practices had stopped, grew up free of Kuru and completely free of Kuru. Now, we knew during that time that <clears throat> a lot of women who had Kuru were pregnant. They gave birth quite successfully. <clears throat> they <clears throat> uh, breastfed their children quite successfully, and none of those children came down with Kuru. So if, if all of this was true, uh, you could conclude quite categorically that Kuru was not transmissible vertically from mother to child through the placenta or through uh, uh, labour, birth, childbirth, or through breast milk. And <clears throat> that was a clear epidemiological conclusion which is... Uh, subsequently been justified because in, in all of our records, not one person born since 1959 has come down with the disease. Well, the, yeah, the, 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 there was a long, there was an argument about whether uh, oral ingestion led to transmission. In fact, Carlton and I disagreed about this. And, um, and Carlton used to, Deborah will remember, he used to rant and rave long after he got the Nobel Prize saying, I never said that cannibalism was the, co was the cause of Kuru or involved in Kuru. He, <clears throat> he maintained that it was the, the mortuary practices led to the handling of, um, of infectious material, which was then rubbed into conjunctivi or onto cuts and scratches, and so therefore was inoculated, and it wasn't through oral ingestion. And, it, and, um, and the initial experiments that were done uh, in primates feeding um, infectious material were negative. But eventually, after a long incubation period, uh, they did, some of them did come down. And uh, Stan, Stanley Prusin and I did a separate experiment in hamsters who normally cannibalize their dead. And we showed that if, through, if, if you allowed a body to be uh, left in the cage and the hamsters cannibalized that, then as th this in strong <coughs> distinction from inoculation into the brain or into the blood or into the peritoneum, <coughs> the transmission was very variable. And the, inc the range of incubation period was very wide. And this is just what uh, we w had predicted from, from Kuru. Whereas if you inoculate um, uh, parenterally, then you can actually titrate the amount of material you put in by the length of the incubation period. So it's very fixed. You put the fixed amount of infectious material in, you'll get a predictable outcome. With, with oral transmission, it was uncertain with a wide range of incubation periods. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, 
to Ben, Rob, and especially Michael, thank you so much for sharing your amazing story with, with us here today. And uh, just, just a reminder that this is just the first of the series of five cutting edge medical documentaries that we, or science documentaries I should say, that we're going to be showing on SBS and each one is going to be linked in some way to some kind of public discussion. So you can watch it online or you can join us again next time. Thank you.